I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I've spent my life connecting people to art to make their lives better. This podcast talks about art in contemporary culture and why we should care. Each episode is an impactful conversation with people I find interesting and think you will too about their life, values, and always about why they think art matters. This is Conversations About Art. Jean Julien is a French graphic artist living and working in Paris. His practice ranges from painting and illustration to photography, video, costume, installations, books, posters, and clothing to create a coherent yet eclectic body of work. We talked about his clan and his mother's iconic hairstyle, describing versus telling, what is enough, how to judge cultural impact, clusters, and saying yes, but. Plus, you get to hear him speaking in French to his young son. I'm curious about how you approach image making. And when I look at your practice there, for me, are topics that you come back to time and again, and not necessarily with the same visual approach, but with related content, the idea of being in nature, the idea of uh, being in relation to someone else, whether it's family or another community. And I wonder where your ideas come from first, and then how you think about translating those ideas into images. Okay. Um, Well, the first thing that sprung to my mind uh, when I heard your question was, how do I come up with ideas or visual, how do I come up with visual ideas? But I think that usually I don't come up with the idea of, of making a visual of it. It's just that I come up with an idea and because my language is visual, that's how it ends up being, if that makes any sense. Mm. I, I try to be... That's something that I, I've touched in the past, but I think it's, it's still relevant, but my visual language has always been fairly unsophisticated, which means that I've always had to or were allowed to by the lack of sophistication to focus on ideas and content and uh, you know it, it doesn't mean that it's important or valuable content or, or highbrow but it is I guess it is for me what I focus on and then the rest is a little bit more spontaneous or instinctive than, than maybe what it might seem sometimes um, as to the specific two topics that you, you touched on um, sorry if you hear <laughs> my son Hugo. You know what? That's crying. what's so yeah. perfect about doing <laughs> right. this in this way is we're talking about family, and there it is. Right there, you go. It, it's uh, it's uh, dinner time for the kids in France, and it's morning for you guys. That's quite funny. Um, yeah, family is. It's just really is what I I grew up with a strong family orientation. Uh, Whenever we go to see a concert of my brother or whenever I do an exhibition, we always travel with family. People sort of uh, mock us uh, a little bit kindly, saying, oh, here's the clan Julian. And it, it, it kind of is what it is. We, we always move in herd. And, and I've always seen that notion as one of the, the most important thing in life. And if you extrapolate that, as you know, you leave the nest. Uh, family is is not just blood. It's a it's a concept. It's people that you feel close enough uh, to rely upon or to or to devote yourself to, and and as many iterations to that family. So for me, uh, the people that matter to me, the people that I'm interested in, or that I care for, I've always been part of my mental environment and hence didn't always been a part of my language to the point where 
Uh, I'm working on the graphic novel at the moment, and the two main characters are iterations of my parents. And it's not necessarily because, I mean, it makes sense in light of the topic, but also it's just because I've drawn them over and over so much that they have become um, signs, visual signs, visual uh, typography in a way. So when you look at, at my work of the past 10 years, whether it's sculpture or video or clothing or, or illustration, you always have this recurrent character, female figure with a, a sort of short black bob, and that's my mom. And she has, I've drawn her so much in my sketchbook that I've sort of summed her up to that, uh, to that haircut. And I really like that idea that as you... I guess as you get older, hopefully you get, or you try to get more articulate within one language, whatever language that might be for me, it's visual. Hence, you, um, you, you, you sharpen your linguistic tools and, and you develop your own characters. And, and that's what it is for me. My parents are, are or some of my loved ones are, are visual characters that are part of a, a a panoply, can you say that in English? They're, they're part of, a, of a, a set that I use to express myself. Um, and in, in um, comedy, in, in humoristic drawings, for instance, for me, it's quite akin to um, theatrical language in the sense that uh, the, the way I do it, at least I try to communicate an idea and I wouldn't be able to give... It's a sophisticated depiction, so I, I give it a, a fairly essential depiction to focus on, on, on the humor, the punchline, or whatever. And in that sense, it's a bit like the theater. In the theater, as opposed to a movie, uh, you're going to try to tell a story with props and things that, so few things that you need to uh, set the scene. And for instance, for me, if I want to, uh, if I want to draw a female character, uh, I will go to the one that is the most essential to me, and that's that character that I've developed over the years. So, in general, I tend to use that character when I do a commission for a newspaper, or when I try to do a cartoon on social media, or when I do uh, a drawing for a print set. Um, so that's family. That's family has a, an affective. Uh, important for me, but also has become uh, a visual tool, which is maybe a bit bizarre. Uh, and then when you when you the, the the nature bit, I think it's something that is maybe more recent. I grew up in the city uh, on the edge on the edge of Brittany. I've always loved the city. I've traveled a fair bit and always lived in cities. But as I grew older, had a family of my own, and maybe became more aware of uh, the world we live in, its, its developments, uh, what's at stake, and things like that. I think, I think like it's, it's quite a thing of the time. I've opened myself to uh, try to be more in touch with the world we live in. Up until that point, the world we lived in was inspirational in its comedic and, and frustrating dynamic and there was a, 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 the cityscape, the urban environment with all of the good comedy material you can find. But as my life sort of angled slowly towards different values or, or rhythm, a slower rhythm as you become a parent, I guess you're, you can't be as dedicated to the 24-7 uh, producing work to be shared and you know, it's a different dynamic. Your focus tends to have to be shared between your work, your loved ones, and things like that. And so slower pace, and I guess, yeah, that, uh, that interest in nature, which brings a lot more philosophical questions as well, uh, is, is linked to that development in my life. I'm really interested in the idea that your mom can be identified in all of your work by her iconic haircut. And if you ask someone what I look like, they will reference my haircut <laughs> because that is, there you um, go. as my kids say, um, iconic. So I love that it's a different color than your mom's, but it's probably the exact same hairstyle. I, I do love this, this notion of icon, you know, and it's obviously something that's, it's a, it's a heavy or strong topic in the history of art and, and the history of graphic language and uh, 
how in in in, in Asian cultures um, the idea of of synthesizing depictions and 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 in the notion of drawing or painting was about visually translating something with with fewer means and there was obviously a Zen essence to it, but there was also um, an intelligence that I'm I've, I've always been quite interested in. It wasn't necessarily about performance precision. It was more about um, storytelling. I always take these two different approaches in 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 drawings or paintings or in communicating something visually. For me, you either want to describe a scene, a situation, or you want to tell about it, you know. And I don't want to describe situations, I want to tell stories. And this notion of, of, of synthesis uh, goes more in that direction for me. The idea of being able to reduce something to its essence I think is important, not just in art, but really in life. And listening to your answers to my first question about family and landscape and the importance of those elements to your creative expression, but also to who you are as a person, feels for me very grounded and authentic and sympathetic, frankly, to my own personal values. And one of the reasons that I have enjoyed spending my life talking to artists is I often find that artists are prescient. They intentionally or unintentionally are, are predictive of the future. And this idea of moving away from a city, focusing more on family, and um, well, having always been part of a clan, I loved that idea, but slowing down the life to prioritize um, those relationships. I mean, that's that's what's happening in the broadest sense of, of the world right now, but it's something that you had put in place previously. And have you taken any time to, to reflect on that, that there seems to maybe be a, a broader alignment with some of the things that you have already been privileging? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I'm privileged in the sense that I come from a background where we, we've always talked about these things. My, uh, my dad is a town planner, and, uh, and, and in my family, we always, we always talked, first and foremost, as a family, and we've also been open to the notions of ecology, nature, consumerism, um, globalization and, and, and its downfalls as we experience at the moment. So my dad's always been quite vehement about this, but in the same time, very encouraging of whatever ways we want to, to go in life. And I think contrary to my siblings, I've had, I've been lucky to, to have been given quite a few commissions from an early age when I was a student and with this, there was the enthusiasm of, of the beginning of, of getting approached by brands and stuff like that. And I, I sort of done that quite a bit. And, and then it's, it has become increasingly difficult over the years to, uh, to do that. And I guess, yeah, I, I've sort of realized that however... Whichever path I was going, experimenting in, uh, I, I would always sort of go back to the values that I had been given by my family, not because I was under a sort of uh, an iron fist, but because it just, that's what I believed in. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I have to say, I do find that quite difficult to navigate um, because I have to earn a living. So you have to do commercial jobs, at least because that's how I started. Progressively, if I could just live from doing painting and graphic novel, that, that would be beautiful because then I wouldn't have these sort of moral dilemmas. But I'm in, a, I'm in a nice position now where I can say no to most things that I don't want to do uh, and try to be more proactive in, in, in the things that goes toward my ethics. But it's not easy. And it's certainly, you know, you said that we the world seems to be going that way. I 
I, I really hope so, but I would argue that it's what we're being told and we collectively, when we put our deck head together, agree that this is where we need to go. We need to decelerate, we need to keep the positive of this globalization situation, which is communication and, and a certain openness to culture, to sensitivities and, and all of this. But we don't necessarily need to uh, export everything we do by the millions, by the second, all the time. You know, there's, there's not just one way to do it. Um, but, but consumerism, liberalism, and all of, all of this is very tempting. That's why it's so successful, you know. Uh, I'd love to buy myself clothes all the time. I'd love to not not give a damn about all these questions, but I guess, I don't know. Yeah, like I, like I say, it's, it's, even if I tried, I think it's something that, uh, that's inculcated, inculcated in, in my family, in me, and I also think that, yes, there is this sort of, what might have been a, a hushering in the past, what has become a vibrating white noise in the background and is, slowly slowly becoming louder and clearer and that's great but i just wonder how we're going to manage to accommodate that society change with how successful the status quo is you know without having because i think the worst would be a dramatic rupture you know would be a, a, a breaking point in civilization where people feel like they have to go from uh miami in the future to the middle age uh, post-apocalyptic. And I, I think because those two views seems to be so opposed, I don't know how we're going to combine them. I think we have to, and I think it's at stake. But I don't know if, if you get what I mean. I do. And one of the things that I have been thinking about for the last few years, certainly pre-pandemic and in the middle of the pandemic too, is this notion of, you know, what is enough and and how is that defined? And not just... That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, not just materially, though that's important, but in terms of status or success or in relationship and how is that defined and, and trying to come up with those those values, those perspectives for myself and being able to say just because everyone else thinks this or everyone else wants that, you know, what is it that, that means the most to me? It's complicated. I I think it's, yeah, I think you're, you're really, it's, it's true. That's the, that's the most difficult part because I think we live in a society where it's, we can collectively agree that being successful is one of the highest ranking achievement in life, whatever success defines. But I don't, I don't think that was always the case in different societies. I think if you look back when I guess religion was stronger or where individual freedom wasn't as, as strong, the, the goals in life or, 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 or the things you would be angling towards that, that would dictate your life would be different. But for the past probably century or at least after the war, the idea of, of being individually successful has been the driving force. And that sort of, that can't work anymore. Um, but I don't, I don't know how we can, because there are great things about individualism as well. Let's not forget, you know, uh, I, I think if you, if you focus on yourself, if you introspective, if you, some great stuff can come out of that. I mean, we know artistically uh, art tends to be something that looks at society, but it's also extremely self-involved. Uh, you, you need time to come up with ideas and to experience, experiment, uh, fail, and finally deliver. So I don't think that a bit of self-involvement is, is necessarily negative, but I think we've, we, we've come to the conclusion that as a society model, it's not good. Um, but then is it daunting, the unknown, or is it very exciting? And is it not the perfect time for people to actually think, reflect, and come up with new perspectives? 
I have so many things I want to say based on what you're saying. I'm <laughs> loving our conversation. But it, it, it's weird for me to talk about that so open, I guess, because we're already on exchange and, and I, I felt comfortable and it was really exciting to be able to talk again. But I have to say, normally, I try to have hints of those topics in my work, but it's not something that I feel comfortable always talking about so candidly uh, in media is because... I'm the first one to make a lot of mistakes and contradictory um, decisions in my work and career. And I certainly wouldn't want to appear like a lesson giver because I don't have the answers. And like I said, I make a lot of mistakes. I make compromises like all of us. And yeah, but it, they are yeah. interesting topics to talk about. I think the beauty of life can be found in that duality. And that's probably one of the most basic definitions of being human is finding your way on your path and yeah. making mistakes and having uh, successes and having things that you're proud of and things that you're embarrassed by and things that you have learned from. And I talking agree. About this, but this idea of, of success and... It, it makes so much sense to me because when you talk about a different time where maybe the h highest kind of status, if you will, in a community would be maybe the person who was the most pious, right? Or yeah. maybe the person who, you know, could catch the most fish or, but. Oh, that was right. the wisest, you know, who would have the more right. story to tell from collecting ancient stories. But yeah, th there are very different roles from what we have right now. But there, that wasn't outward, right? Like, how would you know? You would only know because someone would tell you, right? Like, they would point to that woman and say, you know, she can heal people. Or, you yeah, know, point absolutely. to that man and say, you know, he has seen God or um, whatever it is. And so somehow these more tangible things have stood in for, um, yeah, the values that, that used to be. Maybe better, but, but because there was an uh, there was a, a collective language, a collective narrative, or we communicated those things. I mean, you can bring that back to to culture, and you know, we are but tools to progress. Hopefully, uh, sometimes in evident ways in, in mass marketing, communication, advertising, journalism or things like that, or sometimes in more obscure um, painting, sculpture shows, but it's, it's, a, it's a global effort. I want to come back to this idea of, of the unknown and, and how you and I and all of us feel about approaching it, but you, you referenced how much there is in terms of media and and i think it's amazing that now basically anyone has a platform to put out there what it is they're you know making or thinking or and and i love that kind of popularization of of that method of disseminating you know images mm. and, and words and within that it's harder i think to be heard so I wonder yes, what some of your, yeah, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how to shine the light on what is, what you want to share with, with the world. It's very tricky. Uh, you know what earlier when I was, uh, I was talking about uh, not feeling comfortable giving my opinion on these matters because uh, because I don't want to be a lesson giver. I think I also strongly, I think freedom of speech is one of the, the most important notion in life, in, in freedom, in, in justice, evidently. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to the state we're in right now, obviously, politically, um, collectively, but also yeah, how do you exist today if there's a sort of 
um, everybody has the same rights, which is the ideal in society. But on social right. media, it's just such a, a cultural cacophony. It's extremely right. difficult to to know what's good, worthy, uh, potentially long lasting. I guess that's mm -hmm. down to individual judgment, which is good. But I have to say, if you, I, I had this reflection. It's going to sound like a, an old veteran, even though I don't think I'm very old. But uh, thinking about the the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, uh, Paul Newman, Bob Marley, or a few of the people that we, when I grew up, were like, "Wow, those are icons." Mm -hmm. And now I wouldn't be able to tell you which who are the icons of all times for me because you know there's so many people that I like, but is there anyone that I herald as iconic? No. Or maybe it's too early to say, but I feel like the more people you add, the more difficult it is to uh to have someone stand out. And then one could argue that back then were those people that great or is it just that there was less people to compete with? <laughs> I don't know why, but I keep thinking about that. Like, how how many how many Matisse, Villar, Picasso uh, is there out there right now on Instagram? Probably loads. It's just that the context is different. It's very difficult to. Uh, I work with a few people, like um, this guy Mathieu from K Studio. He's out in Belgium and he, he does art editions. Uh, he, he does well. It's, it, it's I really really respect that guy and his vision. I'm like, he's one of the very few person that I know is going to find people that somehow are great. And then when you see who he works with, there's some people who have like 300 followers or 700,000. And it's just because, okay, he's, he's someone that, that does manage to navigate throughout all of this mess. I don't feel able to do that. And I don't think that collectively we are. So what ends up happening is that we live in clusters, communities, as they do on social media. And, and I think we, we're theoretically one global community, but we're very tribal. Um, so we have our Rolling Stones and our Beatles within communities. And instead of being defined by borders, those communities are defined by like-mindedness, age groups maybe. Uh, culture. Totally fascinating. I think about that at the moment. It, it's a, it's a, it's an open ended question, but it's something that's like. But again, because I think like I've I've been lucky enough to enjoy a nice following for for quite a few years now, and I feel really lucky. But sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, am I going down? Like I think the same existential crisis that everyone goes through, and and sometimes especially artists, but. And you think, am I successful and this and that? And then I'm like, well, why do I do it for? Like, you know, do I do it because I want a certain cultural recognition? Do I want number recognition? Or it's, I think it's all linked when we're talking about society model as well as where, where, where we go in light of what's been before, what goes after. It's tricky. I, f I think we're 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 in a, in a pool that's extremely difficult to. Uh, it's such a crowded pool. It's difficult to to see clearly. Uh, and I think we will. But right now, <laughs> I feel like I've got to focus on broader lessons in life, like nature, families, and things that can seem pretty uncool notions. But at least they're strong <laughs> uh, tutors. Well, I think that's one of the the powers of art and culture is our role in redetermining or determining what is cool. And that's part of, of your power. The power of your platform is to take a stand for what it is that, that you value. I, I'm, I'm interested in, in the notion of clusters. Mm -hmm. I was reading a, post by Seth Gogan the other day and I read one a few weeks ago where he talked about minimum viable audiences and and then a, a predictive post the other day about clusters and his 
idea that people are going to be more geographically and locally focused than than globally focused. So yeah, I, I I'm not so. sure what I think about that yet, but I'm just picking up on on something that you referenced too, and and kind of putting a pin in it as something that I've been I've been thinking about as well. It seems that my wish, and I, and I do think it's inevit- inevitable in a way that we are going to try to focus more on global, uh, on local efforts. Um, but I don't want it to be the end of cultural exchanges, so to speak. You know, I want yes. to I want to put my money in the guy that makes shoes. 10 kilometers away from me and the guy who produces leaks uh, five meters from me. But I'm also really deeply interested in, in the manga that that guy has put out in, in Japan. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's, I, I think in the best of world, we'll all focus collectively in, in being interesting, self-sustainable clusters but that still have means, reasonable means of exchange with other clusters, like constellations. I, there have to be options um, for connectivity across clusters. Different clusters can produce different things, right? There, there can be the, yes, the immediate needs for, you know, food and shelter and what gets tied into that in, in the, um, the local geographic cluster, but then there can be the cross-cultural clusters around creativity and maybe people have gotten better about being able to communicate over distance in this time. So before this, before this, I only did these podcasts in person I would travel to wherever it was that someone lived or worked and would sit down with them and, and be face to face. But this uh, is, I wish you could do that. <laughs> well, I would like to still do that. And you'd, you'd come to Brittany by the seaside. That'd be pretty nice. I oh, I would come going to, to do you that. Are. I'm taking that as an invitation <laughs> for a future. It is an invitation the, for sure. <laughs> and, and that's part of the unknown and the, idea of predicting what's next and maybe somehow being discerning in a in a better way so i mean i've been trying to approach the unknown with a sense of curiosity and also uh commitment so instead of doing everything which i sort of felt the pressure to do before being more discerning about what I do want to travel for and what I do want to say yes to. And, and yes. maybe that's a, a benefit. I think that, I think that's the, that's the way to go. Um, I, I think it's like, it's not, it's a, it's not saying no, it's saying yes, but it's, uh, it's mm-hmm. being selective. It's taking a bit more time to read, uh, the, cons- the, 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 the the rules and, and, and engagements and yeah, taking time to know what you're getting into instead of just saying yes to everything without thinking there's any consequence to it. I think that's the way to go. Yeah. So describe for me, uh, I don't know, a description of a day that would feel particularly satisfying and productive for you in terms of creative um, production. Okay, so for me, historically, I've um, I, I've always had fairly crappy studios in London um, that didn't look very professional, but that always had my brother and my friends with me, and some foam nerve guns and lots of things to have fun with. <laughs> um, so that that's pretty much what I've always favored is a pleasant social working environment. So my ideal studio, my ideal day in the studio is being surrounded by friends and do as little computer as necessary and then spend the rest of the day playing with 
what's on my desk, trying to see if I can cut out something to make a character and film it, play around with objects and paint as much as possible. I've got a fairly good routine, I would say now, even though I feel like I've always been in between studios for the past few years. Um, but I work with someone uh, called Liz that I, I believe you've exchanged with, who's out in New York and that I met when we were um, still living in London. And, uh, and Liz sort of is the studio director, which means that she oversees everything, talks to clients and, and any work-related people, and she does a fantastic job. She's basically allowed me to just focus on being creative. And so right now, I would say that in my life in general, I do have pretty much what I consider to be the ideal situation. Attends, Lulu, va voir maman si tu veux, parce que papa est en train de parler. Excuse me, guys. Um, Good. And in Paris, we're moving. I was with a friend by the Canal Saint Martin, and I was I didn't have internet, so I was mainly painting and chatting with that friend, watching the water. So that was pretty perfect. But now we're moving to a studio with my brother and three other friends, and the angle is clearly now to have studio that are less desk and laptop and more painting and sculpture and and things like that. Um, Do you like sharing a studio? I do, I always, but that's, yeah, it's the most important thing for me, but I've always felt like I've always had a sort of, uh, I've always felt slightly embarrassed when I had uh, journalists or, or, or clients coming into the studios because I always felt like my studio never looked professional or, you know, wasn't like those great artist studios that you go in and you're like, wow, so that's where, that's where the magic happens. And mine was always like dirty coffee mugs and, and toys and, and piles of paper and, and, and a fairly small desk and my stuff mixed with my friends. Um, but I guess, you know, if you have had that in different iterations over the past 15 years, I guess that's, that's what you're really about. And, and I think that's something that I'm pretty proud of. What else are you most proud of? Uh, relationships that I've managed to keep um, and when I get nice feedback from people when people see your drawings or a painting or whatever you do and they hit you back with something a little bit more personal a story mm. uh, and, and not you're great or this is great but hey I really like that because that reminded me of my that moment I spent with my son at that time or Hey, during that time when you did that drawing, it really, uh, it really affected me. And I want to say thank you. And I've had, I've been extremely lucky to have had that quite a lot, and to still have that. And I've got to say, I'm, I'm proud of that. That connectivity, that ability to put something out in the world and impact how someone understands themselves, is such an incredible gift and part of I guess why I am so committed to you know proselytizing about art <laughs> because people they may have been looking for that experience when they came to your image or your object but probably they weren't you know probably they were just being in the world um, yeah you know, Serendipity, having their coffee, yeah, walking their dog, you know, thinking about, I don't know, whatever they needed to do next. And, mm -hmm. and yet they were open to, um, to that experience. And then I think the communication of that back to you is also so generous because it then fuels your, uh, creativity and and optimism and and idea of, of meaning i guess it makes it for me it makes it less um anonymous or gratuitous um it just feels less like you're sort of shouting at the edge of a cliff and more like you're talking in a room um mm -hmm. it, it's nice it just it just I guess it gives a, a certain meaning to what you do. 
not that you should be a sucker for uh, feedback, but you know, if you're sincere and you do something, it's nice to know that um, that sincerity is understood at times. Um, but also, sometimes it's just nice to, to know that you can make people laugh. Um, it doesn't yeah. always have to be a, a story, but it, it's nice to know. And I think it's also quite flattering to know that you've managed to capture someone's attention in the midst of growing information, competitivity, and overcrowded social media. Yes. So talk, if you would, about humor. When we did that Instagram Live, I told you that I I loved uh, being surprised by your work and and or surprised by some of the things that are happening um, often with the figures in your work. And, and I asked about humor and if you thought that you were funny or the work was funny. And, and I was sort of surprised by your answer, um, but I'd love to, to ask you about that in this format. Um, I'm, gonna tr- I'm trying to remember what I said last time, but uh, I guess it, it, in a sense, no, I, I, I don't think I'm funny. Um, right. but uh, I think yeah the, the, the comedy bit um, if that's what we talked about it is I don't approach it from a comedy point of view but more from a sort of uh, a therapeutical process of seeing a situation that annoys me or triggers me or, or, or bothers me and trying to find a way to deal with it, and and quite usually it's by finding the irony of it, um, and that ends up being, yeah, it's funny when I put out something, I always fear that it's going to be seen as ranty or negative because, in a way, that's what triggered it originally. But mm-hmm. the process of creating the image is always trying to shine a positive light on it. Am I am I true to uh, the recollection you had? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, and Good. we talked a little bit about you know sometimes the the space between the artist's intention and the viewer's reception, and if you're creating it sometimes from a place of kind of irony or frustration or um, something that you might deem as as negative, and then it's read as um, with a certain lightness or a certain kind of humor or resignation, I, I think that, that that transformation is you know part of the power also. Yeah, I think so. So why do you think art matters? Um because it's my vision of it is I'll I'll, I'll take it from from a, uh, a marital point of view, one thing that we, we quite often bicker with my wife, or it's a recurring reproach, is that I'm not efficient or not practical. And I think that's also one of the things I'm the, the proudest about because I think that's also what I, art matters, not having a sense, a clear direction, a clear motive, uh, not having, not being an answer, but being more of a question. Not being efficient in in delivery, but being being challenging uh, and motivating and and unsatisfactory in a way. Uh, and I, and I think this sort of this blurriness, this 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 lack of of clarity, is why it matters because. Uh, I guess, again, that's, that's the difference between describing and, and telling, uh, the difference between uh, robotic and organic, if you want to go, go like that, um, between hard and soft. I think art is, is on the softer side, and I think that's something I really treasure in life because that's, uh, there's a sense of freedom in it. There's no obligation. There's no rules to respect. There's no... Uh, there's no delivery to respect. There's just this sense of exploration and and recreation and 
and this this great sense of freedom. I love that. I love that. You talked about having your mom and your dad as characters or figures in your work. Are you in your work? Are there self portraits? Uh, yeah, there are. Yeah, yes. And actually, in that graphic novel that I'm working on, the main character, one of the main character, will will end up looking like the caricature I make of myself because that's just the the simplest for me to uh, to draw um, and to sort of forget about it, just focus on what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, there are there are so tends to be quite are... self depreciative. <laughs> So what are those characters' best qualities? Uh, the characters that I use, you mean? No, like my mom your or myself, character or? as yourself in your graphic novel. What are his best qualities? Uh, I mean, to be visually quite easy to identify. I mean, in real life, I've got, I've got fairly big features. You know, I've got big ears, big nose. Uh, an elongated face that resembles a rugby ball and a long crown like neck. And I'm quite tall and skinny with long limbs. Uh, and, you know, it used to bother the life out of me. And, uh, and I've got a person that loves me for that. And I think it's also, it, it's given me that uh, assurance that maybe you, you like when you're a teenager. And then I'm like, it's nice to uh, to not be expected to be to be something different, so something a bit uncertain, like those notions we were talking about before. Um, and that also means that when I draw myself as a character, it's very easy and easy to identify. It's not a, a standard character; it's this odd-looking character, more relatable, I suppose. It What's the narrative of, of the graphic novel? Uh, it's, where, where, can I, yeah, I can talk about it. Uh, it's loosely, Just loosely about, yeah. it's about parenting, um, but it's about me as a child and me as a parent and, and how the hopes that I have for my, all the, all the preconceptions that I try not to have, but I inevitably have for my children and, and wondering what they're going to be like in the future, which future they're going to be living in, and then trying to have a, a little bit of empathy for my parents and how they probably have asked themselves the same questions. Um, but it doesn't, I, I realize talking about it, that doesn't really sound humorous like, like the rest of my work, but it will be taken from a humoristic angle and, and fantasy-like as well. It sounds to me like a story uh, or a narrative that is totally relatable and universal. I hope so. And yeah, it gives the opportunity to to share what matters to you and, and the why. You know, I'm always interested in the why. So even if I'm not interested in what someone else is interested in, if they can tell me why yeah. it matters to them. Then, then I care. But actually, I think that I think the questions that I'm going to be asking myself or trying to answer in the book are, are things that are actually rooted in 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 the regular questions I ask myself in my work. And in, in that sense, I think it, it will it will be interesting to people who, who usually like the stuff that I do. But maybe we maybe we'll we'll get to talk again about it when it's out. I hope so. I would, I would love that. I am so glad that I woke up early today to have this conversation with you. <laughs> me too. Such an amazing way to start the day for me and hopefully end the day for Same you. Same for me. Very good way to end the day for me. I'll look forward to being in touch again. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye. bye. Conversations about art is part of art a multi-platform project that connects all to art through a podcast series, books, talks program, brand collaborations, TV, and more. This episode was produced by Simonilla. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Blake Migden assists with social media content editing. 
If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We will be back again every Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks so much for listening.